Live from the CBS Broadcast Center in Midtown Manhattan, this is the Democratic primary debate for Governor of New York. Brought to you by CBS 2 News and News Radio 880. Tonight, Governor Kathy Hochul, Congressman Tom Suozzi, and New York City Public Advocate Jumani Williams face off in the first full debate of the campaign with your moderator, Maurice Dubois, and political reporter, Marsha Kramer. Here is Maurice Dubois. And good evening, everyone. So glad to have you with us tonight. We're looking forward to a robust debate, and we want to thank the candidates for being here, public advocate Jumani Williams, Governor Kathy Hochul, and Congressman Tom Suozzi. We also want to thank our partners, News Radio 880, for co-sponsoring tonight's debate. Before we begin, just a few things to mention. Podium positions have all been selected at random. Each candidate will have one minute to respond to our questions. A rebuttal when necessary will be 45 seconds. And candidates, we are asking you to please respect the time limits. We will turn off the microphones if they are exceeded. Now, all that being said, we are going to get right into it. First question for you tonight, Mr. Williams. In light of all the mass shootings and with the Supreme Court poised to overturn all or part of New York's century-old law prohibiting people from carrying guns without a permit, what steps are you prepared to take to prevent our city and state from becoming the wild, wild west? And thank you so much for having us today, and I thank you for that question. It's a hard question to answer in 60 seconds, uh, but I'm a public advocate of the city of New York. I've been working on these issues uh, for over a decade. And just let me tell you something that I know. Uh, when I saw the bill signing yesterday, uh, and it's already a commercial now, uh, it reminded me of uh, the uh, Cuomo press conferences during the pandemic. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, it was in the middle of the Bronx that has some of the highest shootings that we've seen. Unfortunately, those bills that were signed primarily deal with mass shootings. And we have told the Bronx that we've dealt with the street crime that, that they are dealing with every single day. The one bill that may have dealt with street crimes is micro stamping. We have asked for that for over 10 years. I wish we could have had the support of the governor. And why that bothers me is because this is not theoretical for me. This is not esoteric. We have to deal with the real street violence. And in between those press conferences, death is happening. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Ms. Hochul? We are prepared to address the situation where we anticipate the Supreme Court to overturn a law that's been on the books in the state of New York for nearly 100 years. Literally this afternoon, I convened my policy team as well as working with every town which, and other advocates to come up with the different scenarios. I will tell you within hours of that Supreme Court decision, we will have a response. I've already spoken to the leaders of the Assembly and the Senate about the possibility of even bringing them back for an extraordinary session in order to address this. We cannot have a situation where people can literally carry a gun into subways, into grocery stores, with, with reckless abandon. And I pray the Supreme Court doesn't do that, but we're ready here in New York to take action to protect the people of the state. That is our number one responsibility, so we're ready. And the press conference yesterday, yes, we got so much done that had been hampered and, and unfulfilled for a decade, and I'm really proud we were able to get that over the finish line, again, to protect New Yorkers, whether it's from gun violence in grocery stores or on the streets of Brooklyn or the Bronx or Harlem. Mr. Swazi. You know, there's a crime crisis and a gun crisis here in New York, and people are suffering every single day. Uh, the governor talks about making crime and guns a priority, but 69% of New Yorkers say that she's failing on crime. She talks about crime, but she didn't address the issue of bail reform. Even worse, when the governor was a member of Congress, she voted with, was endorsed by, and took money from the NRA. Where's the principle in that? I'm a proven executive. I'm trained as a CPA and attorney. I was the mayor of my hometown. I was the county executive of Nassau County. I've been a member of Congress for the past five and a years, half years, where I have an F rating from the NRA and co-sponsor every piece of gun violence uh, prevention legislation. Uh, I will fight crime as my number one priority, address the gun crisis we're facing here in New York State. I'll cut taxes, I'll help our troubled schools, and I'll go after the corruption that the Washington Post called make New York State the most corrupt state in the United States of America. There's a big difference between making a speech and passing legislation and actually getting things done. I can do it because I've done it. I'd like to rebut that. But just 15 seconds. No governor has done more in less time than I have to address gun violence. And I'll address that NRA situation. 
That was a decade ago, judging what I've done, because a lot of people have evolved since I took that position. You know what we need? More people to evolve. We have to change the hearts and minds of people all over this country so we can finally have common sense legislation from Washington. Okay, thank I'm you, sorry. Ms. Hoko. We're, we're going to move on. Yeah, this is important because 10 years ago, I wrote my first report on how to deal with gun violence while the governor was touting her A rating for the NRA. I wish we had a support so in between that decade of death, we might have gotten where we are today. We are 10 years behind because people in Congress were doing the bidding of the NRA. And what happened yesterday will do nothing for the 25 people that died in Buffalo on top of the 10 people who were massacred for six months. And I'll only take that, 50, I'll only take 50 seconds. Excuse me, the seconds. next question is for the governor, Mr. Swazi. Uh, governor Hochul, the man accused of killing the Goldman Sachs researcher on the Q train is an example of someone with a long rap sheet who was freed after a judge denied a request for $15,000 bail and instead set one dollar. Many charge that if New York had allowed judges to consider dangerousness like 49 other states, he wouldn't have been on the streets and maybe Daniel Enriquez might still be alive. Why didn't you use the considerable powers of the governor to veto budget items and bills near and dear to the heart of the lawmakers to enact a dangerousness statute? That crime was heartbreaking to know that people are living in that kind of fear and that is why. We did address this. And I'll tell you something about bail reform, though. The fundamental premise behind bail reform, the change of it, was needed. We had a dual system where two people accused of the same offense, one would go to Rikers and one could go back home, usually based on the color of their skin. But when I see a problem or a law that needs to be fixed, I jump into it. That's what we did in my budget and what we did on bail reform. We came up with more standards than judges have ever had in the last few years since it was changed. They can now look at past history, the seriousness of the crime, whether or not there was an order of protection before, whether or not a gun was used. So we gave the power for judges to analyze this and look at it differently than they had been before we made those changes. But, Governor, do you regret that you couldn't get dangerousness as part of, the, as part of your reforms? The, the, what I just described gives the judges discretion to analyze more, more specificity than just the word dangerous. Dangerousness is subjective. I said, do they have an order of protection? Is there a history of gun use? Is there uh, the severe, severity of the crime? So I think what we gave the judges is better than this vague term that can be subjective and many times used against an individual because of the color of their skin. We don't need to go backwards. We need to go forward in a thoughtful way, but we're not compromising either justice or safety. <clears throat> Mr. Swazi. I 100% support giving judges the discretion to consider dangerousness of the defendants who come before them, as you mentioned, Marcia, the same as it is in 49 other states in the United States of America. The governor says she cares about crime, she wants to address crime, but she does nothing to fix bail reform. Uh, it's hard to imagine uh, that this governor can continue to say that she cares about crime, but 69% of New Yorkers say she's failing on crime. She says she jumps right in. Well, when it came to the Buffalo Bill Stadium, she got something done that nobody thought could get done. It's so unpopular. It's a billion dollars, the most lucrative deal in the history of the NFL. She got that done. She twisted arms. But when it came to bail reform, she didn't engage. When it came to so many other issues that are important to New Yorkers, like enforcing and implementing the red flag law, she didn't engage. It goes on and on with examples of where you can just talk about something, but it's very different to actually get something done. That's why it matters if you're a proven executive who has a proven record of getting things done. Mr. Williams. Terea Starnes, Jeffrey Whitehead, Dominique Sylvester. Those are people who were in my high school in the 90s who died from gun violence. A bullet went through my mother's car door while it was parked in front of her home. These are not theoretical things for me. These are personal. This is not esoteric. This is why I spent the better part of my career actually finding out what stops gun violence. And so when we asked for a billion dollars to be put into the budget to address the type of gun violence that the bills that were signed would never address, it would not have protected Daniel, that strap hanger who was going to get brunch on a subway. It would have not have stopped 11-year-old Kiera from why being do you shot. Think it wouldn't have why do you think it wouldn't have stopped the, the gunman who, who attacked the guy on the Q train? Why? Well, dangerousness, I have to tell you, I have to remind folks. As you mentioned, it's in 49 other states. 
Many of those states have cities whose gun violence is worse than us. That's why you need a governor who has spent their life working on figuring out how to stop the gun violence. I'm proud of the leadership that so we took. So you're against the dangerousness. But I want to be clear. I'm proud of the leadership that I took in the decade that the governor was supported by the NRA from 2012 to 2018 to help this city become the safest it has ever been. That research, that work that we've done is what I want to take to Albany. From Brooklyn to Buffalo, people are dealing with gun violence in a way that we haven't dealt with in a very long time. It's important to have someone that understands just the press conferences, like Andrew Cuomo did while people were dying due to the pandemic, will not stop people from dying. I'm tired of going from press conference to funeral. Marsha, I need to address that, what? please. 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 Uh, the purpose of the press conference gathering people was to s take a pen and sign into law 10 bills that no one had ever undertaken before. You mentioned micro-stepping took a decade. I've been the governor for nine months. I got it done in record time. I made sure that we have resources to go to community violence disruption programs, tripling the amount of money, so we can get at root causes, but also give the tools to law enforcement to do their jobs. Banning ghost guns, banning guns that defy description. You should see some of these weapons that we're seizing. And you know why we're seizing them? Because I told our state police to work for the first time ever with nine other states, put together a consortium, and stop the illegal guns from flowing from Georgia and Tennessee and Pennsylvania into our streets. Thank I'm you, sorry, that, that micro-stamping yeah. bill you. doesn't take effect for four years. People will be shot in the next four years while we wait for that micro-stamping bill. And let, let me just seconds, say one thing. Just if I can, all three of us up here support... 15 seconds, Mr. Swazi. All three of us up here support the gun legislation that's been passed. It's great. It's wonderful. It's fantastic. Only one of us standing up here has ever been endorsed by the NRA, taken money from the NRA. Okay, we're going to move on. We're, we're, we're going to move on. Thank you. Thank you all. Mr. Swazi, this is for you. What, what do you have to say about the House ethics probe into charges that you failed for years to, in a timely fashion report stock transactions worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, the main point you just made there is a timely fashion. Every year I would file annual disclosures as required by the House. And my accountant discussed it with the House Ethics Committee every single year. After five years, they said, you have to file periodic trans uh, transaction reports as well every 45 days after a trade. When they told us that, we did it. It's a paperwork <clears throat> thing. It's a paperwork error. The reality is we've corrected it, and we're moving forward uh, with this uh, on a going forward basis. But this is nothing compared to a lieutenant governor getting arrested, a hand-picked lieutenant governor getting arrested for bribery and corruption. This is nothing compared to the Buffalo Bills deal, which was a secret deal that was not even gone through any single public hearing, despite the fact it's the largest uh, giveaway of taxpayer dollars in the history of the NFL. Either of you want to rebut? Oh, I'd be delighted to. Please do. Um, let me talk about that lieutenant governor situation because it was very, very disappointing to me that those charges were brought because we worked with the information we had at the time. And I promised the voters of New York and the people of the state that I would do everything I can to restore their faith in government. And that was a setback. But I have been able to build an incredible team, the most diverse, the most talented, group of individuals, people like Catherine Garcia to lead our state operations, Dr. Mary Bassett. So I have put together a leadership team that is second to none, and it's mostly driven by women because they see the world very differently in a way that has not been part of a leadership team of this state in its history. So I'm proud of what we've done, and I know our new lieutenant governor, Antonio Delgado, is going to be an amazing partner leading this state forward for the years to come. <clears throat> Governor, the next question happens to be well, for Mr. you. Mr. Williams, bef before we move yeah, on. What I, what I wanted to say is when I began to run for governor, I will, I would, what I said was that if we're not careful, we're going to get more of what we got with former Governor Cuomo. Unfortunately, when we look at this budget, when we look at the legislative session, the question we should ask are the New Yorkers who need the most help better off, and they aren't. And that's because of how Albany works. And that's what I want to focus on as governor, to make sure the people who aren't House, who are facing eviction, who are facing foreclosure, who do not have health care, who are dealing with real gun violence, can have a governor that understands how to really address those issues. Thank you. Governor, um, there have been questions about the propriety of your involvement in the Buffalo Bill Stadium deal. Given the fact that your husband is general counsel to a company which holds concession rights at the current Bill Stadium, to avoid the appearance of impropriety, should that company be precluded from bidding on the concessions at the new stadium? 
I worked hard to structure the best deal I could, the benefit of the taxpayers in negotiating that. There is no connection between this company that does concessions. They literally sell beer and hot dogs at the games. They had nothing to do with negotiations. The company, the owners, can select anybody they want to do concessions. And if the bills left, this company could still do them. They do them around the globe. But I will also say, my husband, mm. for 30 years, was a federal prosecutor. He upheld the law. And he was Barack Obama's United States attorney for eight years in Western New York. We've had to always have a separation between our responsibilities, particularly when I was a member of Congress. I'm proud of his work. His ethics are second to none, as are mine. We know what's important to the people of the state, and that is to continue restoring their faith in government. And that is something I take seriously every single day. Okay. Just, yeah. Mr. Mr. Williams, do you have a response? Yeah, once uh, Congress is where we needed these gun changes to be made. That has nothing to do with the Buffalo Bills issue. No, it is, because Buffalo Bills, we asked for a billion dollars to be put in what we, for gun violence prevention. What we got was a billion dollars for a billionaire stadium that hired her husband. Outside of Buffalo, where 25 people were shot in six months, and we dealt with some bills that helped 10, which is important. But I want to go back to the money that she said she was put in. It was $18 million. That's not even a million per county. We need to have someone that's going to stop the budget to say we need more money for gun violence prevention, not a billionaire to get a stadium to be built outside of Buffalo where people are suffering. Mr. Swasey. You know, New Yorkers had such high hopes when the governor took office, and she pledged to make it the most ethical, the most transparent <clears throat> government in the history of New York State. And that simply hasn't happened. That's why we see the Siena poll, how disappointed uh, New Yorkers are. Uh, this issue with her husband being the general counsel to Delaware North, Delaware North sells $11 beers to people. Uh, it costs you so much to buy a ticket there. And yet, we're asking taxpayers to put up a billion dollars to subsidize this stadium. That's the biggest taxpayer giveaway in the history of the NFL. And even worse, it was announced four days before the budget was due. A budget process that Blair Horner from Nightperk said was the most secretive budget process he's ever seen in the 30 years he's been in Albany. And with, they announced it four days before the budget was due, and there was no public hearing whatsoever. Governor, did you want to respond? I structured a deal that was the best we could do for the taxpayers of New York, and here's what we accomplished. That stadium will be more than paid for. The tax revenues derived from the income as well as the economic benefit we did a study in advance. It'll far exceed the investment in state. <clears throat> we also create 100, I'm sorry, 10,000 new jobs, critically important in an area like Western New York. But also, I understand people <clears throat> questioning this. I really do. I represent a very large, diverse state. Every part of the state has regional priorities. This is, the Buffalo Bills is to the identity of Western New York the way Broadway is to New York City. It's part of who they are. And I made sure that they're going to stay there for the next 30 years. And I will also continue to address the regional priorities of the rest of the state. Okay. I'm doing that now. Thank you. We, we, we need on. to move on. We need to move on. We're move Thank on. you all. We need to move on. Our next question here now is from our debate partners. This is from Steve Burns of News Radio 880. Given that the legislature has approved three casino licenses for downstate New York, should one be built in Manhattan and why or why not? Casino in Manhattan. We're going to start with you, Mr. Williams. So first, I do have to talk about, because every economist says that a stadium does not bring a return. Uh, and gun violence is not just regional, it is through this entire state. Uh, as at the moment, I do want to look at uh, the, where we would put any casinos. I am concerned about trying to get folks who are already having problems with paying their bills to go to casinos. So I'm not opposed to it, but I do need to look more at it, and I'm not sure that Manhattan would be a place uh, to build. Mr. Swazi? It's appropriate that you're asking a casino question, because in the previous question, the governor talked about how she would fund the Buffalo Bill Stadium. And when she first announced the funding of the Buffalo Bill Stadium, she said $450 million would come from the Seneca Nation. The Seneca Nation has a casino that was had a dispute with the state for years, and she strong-armed the Seneca Nation to pay $450 million right before the Buffalo Bills de deal was announced. Surprise, surprise. Who's the main competitor with the Seneca casinos? Delaware North, the same company that has the concessions for the Buffalo Bills, the same company that her husband is the general counsel for. 
But how do you stand on the Manhattan Casino? As far as the Manhattan Casino goes, I'm not opposed to it, but I'd rather have some public hearings, find out what the people have to say locally, as well as the state legislature to have public hearings on the location. Ms. Hochul, let's start with the casino. Which casino? <laughs> Should there be a casino in Manhattan? I took the steps to make sure that we could have the option to consider three casinos in addition to the seven that have already been approved. We believe it's going to create jobs, uh, fill our hotels, help our, our convention economy, which is so important. They were hit so hard during the past. So this is going to be an opportunity for us. I'm not going to put my finger on the scale and say where I want this to go because I want to get the outside experts, the people who are charged with this, to make the decision and do the analysis at existing sites. There's some in Queens, there's some in Westchester, there's some in Nassau, as well as Manhattan. So, so as governor, it's my responsibility to be open-minded to all these options right now, and that's what exactly what I'm doing. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to this next question here. Mr. Swazi, many people are unwilling to return to their offices these days. A study by the Partnership for New York City found that just 8% of the people are back five days a week, and average weekdays show that 38% of the people who work in the central business district of the city are actually here. Given those low numbers, does enacting congestion pricing right now in the next few months, does that make sense or should it be postponed in the interest of economic recovery? It should be postponed for at least a year. Uh, I'm a big supporter of congestion pricing. I actually talked about it back in 2006 before Mayor Bloomberg even talked about it. I support congestion pricing, but not now in the middle of this financial crisis we're facing. And why are people not coming back to New York? They're not coming back to New York to their offices because they're afraid. They're afraid to take the subways. People are scared. Well, I just saw the news tonight of a, of, of a man throwing a woman onto the train tracks. It's terrifying. 91% of New Yorkers say that crime is a serious or a very serious issue. 74% say they're afraid they're going to be the victim of a violent crime. We saw the cops getting killed. We saw this 11-year-old girl getting shot. We saw this uh, Mr. Enriquez getting shot on his way to work on a Sunday morning. I went, was with a bunch of mothers the other day who all lost their kids to crime and gun violence. Bodegas are getting robbed on a regular basis. Crime is the number one issue that we face in the state right now, and I have a 15-point plan to address it, not just bail reform, but addressing mental health and helping our schools and helping kids. Ms. Hochul, congestion pricing, should it happen now or later? I support congestion pricing, but we've been in negotiations with the federal government that has the say on the next step, and they have now put some other, I would call them, hurdles in the way that we have to overcome. So this is not going to happen over the next year under any circumstances. But now is not the right time. Uh, you know, we're t we are working very hard. It's like the reason I didn't raise prices on the subways. I said we're trying to encourage people to use a service, trying to sell a product in a sense. And so we actually uh, found more ways to have metro cards that give people bigger discounts every single day. They use it over the course of a week or a month. So, so we're focused on doing everything we can to encourage people to come back. But this is the post-pandemic world. We're not going to see many people come back five days a week. So I'm saying, and what I did today was talk about office conversions to residential. Today I signed a bill that allows for hotel conversions to residential. I want more people who work here to be able to live in this city. And that has not been the case for a long time because of the affordability crisis, something that we're leaning hard into and beginning to solve. Governor Mr. Hochul, Mr. if I could just interrupt for a second, could you tell us how long congestion pricing is going to be delayed in New York? I don't have the answer. We're in conversation with the federal government. They just asked us to deal with an additional environmental issue. Uh, so I don't think it's going to be before the end of this year. I'm rather certain of that. So we're asking them for a time frame, but we are on a path. And now we have to address uh, their concerns and their flags that they've raised. So, uh, so we're committed to getting it done. Mr. Williams, congestion pricing now or delay it? So first, the answer is we should do it now. Uh, something I've been supporting for uh, a very long time and is important not only because of the climate, uh, but because of the revenue we need uh, to deal with uh, so many issues. Uh, the peop reason people are not going back to work primarily uh, is because we keep trying to go back to a normal that harmed New Yorkers. And so just like I led when it came to making the streets safe, when we went from 2012, where gun violence was out of control, to 2018 pre-pandemic, we're leading by example. What we have to do is have a hybrid remote option so people can travel back and forth to work and keep that economy going, but also realizing that they can have a better work-life balance um, and also help the economy around where they live. These are the things that workers are asking for. These are the things that New Yorkers are asking for. And we need a governor who's going to lead by example. Uh, I'm that governor. Thank you. Next question is to you, Governor Hochul. Um, you've made a commitment to provide state emergency funds to pay for the abortions of people who come here from other states. 
Some question why New York State taxpayers should foot the bill to provide abortions to out-of-state residents. Why should New Yorkers do that when taxes in our state are already among the highest in the nation? We have put forth a plan in response to what we anticipate will be one of the most egregious Supreme Court decisions in the history of our nation. They've already telegraphed that they plan to overturn Roe v. Wade, something that was the fight of my mother's generation. And I sure didn't think it would have to be the fight of my new granddaughter's generation. So New York is going to stand firm in protecting women's rights here. The money we allocated from a, a fund in our Department of Health is to ramp up the services for New Yorkers, to make sure that we have services available for uh, hire more people to expand their space. We do anticipate people be coming, but we're not playing. We're not using taxpayer dollars to bring people here. That has been a, that was an idea that was proposed in the legislature. We're simply helping our existing providers be ready. We already have people from Ohio traveling to Western New York to get services now because their laws are already more restrictive. So we need to be ready for them. But my job is to make sure that New York women are not denied these services that, as a woman, I take very seriously. Mr. Williams. We, of course, have to make sure that women and pregnant people have an ability to have safe, accessible, and illegal abortion. That is our job to make sure that we protect New Yorkers. We also have to lead because the nation, as was mentioned, is going in the wrong direction. And so we have to use those funds to protect all people who need that service. I am disappointed that there were two women in the legislature, uh, women of more color, that had two bills that moved us further along reproductive justice. It was the Equality Amendment and it was the Equity Fund. Unfortunately, those two things weren't passed. Those were the best ways to protect black and brown women and pregnant people. We couldn't get that across the finish line. When I'm governor, I'll make sure we do, so that the New Yorkers who need the most help, Americans who need the most help, we're the ones we protect. Mr. Swazi. Abortion must remain safe, legal, and accessible, and New York should be a leader for the rest of the country on this issue. Uh, I don't think there's any daylight between the three of us on this particular issue. Uh, I think that we should also be a leader here in New York State to try and prevent unintended pregnancies by educating people and by providing contraception so that we can prevent unintended pregnancies uh, from happening. Uh, the governor had a commercial out recently uh, where she made the topic abortion, and she said she was going to fight to get a constitutional amendment here in New York State. But she didn't put her weight behind it, and it didn't pass through the legislature during the legislative session, even though she was running a commercial saying that she would make a constitutional amendment uh, as part of this legislative session. So when the governor puts her mind to something, like the Buffalo Bills, she gets it done. But when it comes to bail reform, mayoral control, the other things she doesn't get done. You know, talk governor. about daylight. There's so much bright daylight between our positions that I need to find a pair of sunglasses. I will tell you that I don't think that the right to have an abortion should be reserved only for wealthy women. Mm -hmm. That is why I don't know how you think you can hide from your vote on the Hyde Amendment to support denying Medicaid services and funding for poor women and leave it just for wealthy people in neighborhoods where others have grown up. Um, so I, I, I believe that New York is going to continue to lead. I know we're going to continue to lead on this, and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it as the first woman governor of this state to say, I'm bringing my values to bear right now and to send a message around this nation that New York will protect its women. We welcome others to come to our state and we pray the Supreme Court will all of a sudden get a conscience and not be so politicized that they would take away a right that we have held dear to our hearts for decades. A brief response, Mr. Scott. Let me just say very clearly, I have 100% rating from Planned Parenthood. My votes are exactly the same in Congress as Nancy Pelosi and Rosa DeLauro, and I don't know what the governor's talking about. Next topic, thank you. With marijuana now legal, Mr. Swazi, what are you going to do to protect those adults and children who don't want to be exposed to and forced to inhale marijuana smoke? Yeah, this is a real challenge that we face. Uh, I face it when I'm walking in the streets of the city as well as everybody else does. You always smell uh, people smoking pot when you're walking down the streets these days. 75% uh, of the people in jail have a drug, alcohol, or mental health problem. Uh, we have to recognize the fact that marijuana uh, needs to be also be, when it's decriminalized and regulated, we have to make sure that people don't use it as a gateway into other drugs in the future. How, how do you prevent people getting it secondhand when they don't want it? 
it's very important as far as education, and it's very important as far as people can only smoke in legal locations. So you shouldn't be able to smoke out in the open air, uh, the same as you're not allowed to drink out in the open air. Ms. Hochul? I'd like to address the whole concept behind the cannabis industry, and we'll get to the specific question. I'm very proud that I was able to take steps literally weeks within uh, the time frame of becoming governor to open up an industry that we believe is going to be beneficial for taxpayers, farmers, but also to help the communities that have been targeted for decades. The mass incarceration that resulted because of disproportionate rest of young people. We have now, in, in black and brown communities, we have worked hard to make sure that the licenses and the opportunities to economic benefit go to those targeted communities. But what you're talking about is important to me. I'm working with our Commissioner of Health to put together a PSA right now to talk about how we have to respect each other's space to understand that people do not want to be inhaling, whether it's cigarette smoke or marijuana smoke. No one should have to be exposed to that. So we're working on that right now in our, with our Commissioner of Health and individuals focused on this. Mr. Williams, how do you prevent that? Uh, it is important, uh, I'd say, if we're talking about black and brown communities, uh, that's where I'm from. And so I understand those same communities that have been abused by drug laws that uh, uh, made things illegal that are now going to be legal, we have to make sure that we write that. Uh, as was mentioned, same places where you uh, shouldn't drink, you shouldn't smoke marijuana. But we have to make sure we push this forward because it is a social justice issue. Those same communities, by the way, and I have to say this, sorry, not sorry, <clears throat> are dealing with gun violence. <clears throat> and I have to bring up the stadium because those hundred jobs will not go to East Buffalo because they have no cars or no transportation to go there. I'm saying that because East Buffalo, I spoke to those folks, have been a transit desert, have been a food desert, something that the governor brought up when the mass shooting happened. The question I have is when do we do something about it? If that is how you would treat your neighbors, if that is how you would treat a black community where you live, how are you going to treat Brooklyn, Syracuse, the Bronx, East Flatbush, Schenectady? This is important because these communities are afraid and they need someone who has provided the leadership to deal with the issues that they've been dealing with for far too long. Mr. Williams, the next question does go to you. Um, I'm wondering if you would endorse Bill de Blasio for congressional race if he asked you why or why not, and do you think he would make a good congressman? I am um, running for governor. Uh, uh, he has not asked me. I don't think he will ask me, uh, so my preference is Would he not. make a good congressman? Uh, I'm, I will say I have made my issues with the former mayor when he was mayor. Uh, I am probably going to weigh in with uh, that uh, race, so I don't want to tip my hand. Uh, but those concerns are still there. I do think... Come on, um, take, tip your hand right here. Oh, I can't tip my hand. Oh, right you here. can. I, I it's the question. That. You're supposed to answer it. Yes, what I'm doing now is trying to make sure that New Yorkers have housing, have food, have public safety, have an economy that works for them. And so when we endorse in, the, in, the, in that district, we'll be happy to answer that question. Mr. Swazzy? I'm not going to endorse Bill de Blasio for Congress. Why not? Uh, I don't think he's the best person for the job. But, he, but you have some experience in Congress. Don't you think he could make some kind of a contribution? You know, I'm very concerned about what's happening in our politics in the United States of America today, where everybody's just battling with each other all the, all the time. We have the far right, we have the far left, and people just fight with each other and try to, instead of trying to get things done. Uh, I'm a common-sense Democrat. I'm not going to pander to the left. I'm not going to back down to the right. And I'm looking for other common-sense Democrats to run for Congress, because we need to have a different conversation in our country. So are you are saying Bill de Blasio is not a common sense Democrat? No, I don't. I think that he sometimes goes too far to the democratic orthodoxy instead of trying to work across party lines to get things mm -hmm. done on behalf of the people. Governor? I'll be weighing in in the general election in these races because I'm going to be using uh, my name, my reputation, my resources to help elect Democrats to Congress all over the state of New York against Republicans in November because there's so much on the line. We have not only the Supreme Court against us, but we have so many issues, like money we're waiting for for child care to come for us. But if he maybe we'll de Blasio somebody... was the nominee in that district, would you endorse him or would you just withhold your endorsement because you might have reservations about him? I'm not getting involved in primaries. Okay. Next question is for you, Ms. Hochul. Should mentally ill people living on the streets and subways be removed against their will and held involuntarily until they get the humane treatment that they need? What we did the first week Eric Adams was sworn into office, I went with him into the subway 
and announced that we're working in partnership. And let me put an emphasis on that. First time in a decade that a mayor and a governor have actually worked together toward solving a common problem. And we talked about how we can pull his resources, our resources, to have these support teams. Not one person yanking you off the street, throwing you in a shelter and you're back again. That's inhumane and it doesn't work. So we're working together to have mental health experts, health experts, social workers, <coughs> and people who can help find them housing to go into where they can actually get supportive services that are long term. Just the bill I signed today will create hundreds of more, perhaps thousands more but units. The, the thrust of what I'm getting at is should they be removed against their will and be given humane treatment that they need? It depends on the severity of the illness. If they're demonstrating that they could cause harm to themselves or other, that takes it to a different standard. One of the reforms we did in our budget as part of our comprehensive to, our package to ad address public safety was to deal with Kendra's law and also to talk about the rights we have to protect ourselves as a society as well. I believe in that. Respecting individual rights, getting them services, but if someone has demonstrated they could cause harm to others, then we have a responsibility to help that person get services and protect other riders or wherever situation they're in. That's your standard, not just that they're mentally ill. Mr. Williams? Can you please repeat the question? Should mentally ill people living on the streets and subways be removed against their will and held involuntarily until they get the treatment that they need? First, I do want to say I find it interesting that there would be no endorsement in the primary. The Democratic committee has already endorsed, and I really wish the governor would say the same thing to the state committee, so there would be no endorsement during this primary. Uh, what I would say uh, is most people who are mentally ill are not violent. What they need is a continuum of care. One of my first reports I put out as one of the city, uh, citywide elected officials was on mental health, trying to show what we can do to create that continuum of care. I will tell you, in speaking to law enforcement, they don't want to be the ones responding. Who should be responding to people who are in acute crisis, which I think you're bringing to, are the people who have the most uh, have, have peer networks and people who have uh, medical uh, medical expertise. But what we're because, getting at is yes. people who need care. So, but, but should we take them off the street? But we have to be careful. That the last time we allowed this, it went crazy. The question is, we do have to change the law to allow some people to be involuntary put into a place so they can get assistance. But what we have to make sure is that we don't cross that threshold just willy-nilly. And so most people who are in acute mental health crisis actually may not need to be removed involuntarily if they have the right supports there at that moment in time. And so what we've found, if you can get people that are not necessarily police as a first responders, they can, peers who have dealt with this, people who have experience and do this, can really engage with that person so they're not need to be forcibly removed. What we keep doing is mixing the worst case scenarios with most scenarios that don't happen. And again, that's why having someone who's dealt with these issues for the past decade and has put forth plans, some of which have helped us get to where we were pre-pandemic, is the type of person that you need for governor of the state of New York. Right. You know, I'm, I'm very passionate fuzzy. about this issue. Uh, when I lived in Manhattan yeah. from 1984 to 1991, uh, when I was in law school, I used to supervise, sleep overnight at a homeless shelter. Uh, it was such a, a big problem back in the 80s, and we see it coming back again. Uh, there are 18 and a half million people in New York State. Of those 18 and a half million people, one and a half million people have a serious mental health problem, not just anxiety, but schizophrenia, bipolar, severe depression. And so if somebody's living on the streets and it's 10 degrees out and they have a big sore on their leg and they're muttering to themselves, that person is a danger to themselves and a danger to others. And we have to give police and social workers and mental health workers uh, and family members the ability to take those folks off the streets to get them the humane care that you mentioned, Maurice, so that they can take their medication, so they can get the treatment they need. We need a comprehensive plan for mental health. 75% of the people in jail have a drug, alcohol, or mental health problem. Families are scared to take their kids down the street when somebody who's mentally ill is on the street uh, 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 acting out. We have to address this as the real problem as it is. As it is. Thank you. I have to say, I have Mr. Tourette's Williams? Syndrome. I have Tourette's syndrome. I remember being on an Amtrak train uh, when I had a particular uh, loud amounts of ticks. I was almost removed from that Amtrak by someone who didn't understand what was going on. Thankfully, I was able to speak and let them know what's going on, and I wasn't removed. And that's the reason I try to take care when I'm answering these questions. Again, these things are not theoretical to me. It's not just things I read about in the paper or see on TV. These are things that I've dealt with, my family's dealt with, my constituents have dealt with. And so I try to make sure that I think about the real answers to these questions so we don't tell people in New York that we're going to keep them safe when we're not. They want to be safe. 
they want to feel safe. And I have great expertise and leadership in doing that. Thank Mr. You. Williams, the New York City Council passed a law to allow people with green cards to vote in local elections. Should this be extended statewide, people with green cards allowed to vote in, in elections, local elections, every place in the state? Uh, let's be 100... 30 seconds. You have 30 seconds. How do we get to 30 seconds so quick? But, uh, we're, we're going to is, the end of the debate. Uh, this is... I want to be clear. Uh, Non-citizens have been voting in this country longer than they haven't been. So the city council simply restored uh, a vote, a right that was already there. And of course, in the state, we want to make sure that everyone is civically engaged. And that includes some of our non-citizen residents uh, who are dealing with the impacts of very bad policy. Mr. Swazi, 30 seconds. I don't think the vote should be extended. Uh, I'm a very great supporter of immigrants. Uh, I, in 1994, I started the first day worker center anywhere on the East Coast of the United States of America when I was mayor of the city of Glen Cove. In, when I was county executive in Nassau County, I kicked ICE out of Nassau County. I was the person of the year for the New York Immigration Coalition. I'm a first-generation American. My father was born in Italy. I support immigrants. I support the undocumented, try and help them live the best life they can here in the United States of America. But the right to vote should be reserved for citizens. Governor, 30 seconds. Specifically on the question, <clears throat> I respect the right of a locality to make that decision as they did in New York City. But I will not be proposing that it be extended to the entire state. But these are individuals who live among us. They have rights. That is why I worked so hard to make sure that there was over $2 billion in funding for excluded workers that no one had worked on before. We've worked on so many programs to help lift them up and make them feel part of the New York family. Thank you, Ms. Hochul. Mr. Swazi. Excluded worker fund to be extended, and we couldn't get it. Thank I just you. want to be clear. Move Thank on. you. Mr. Swazi, 30 seconds here. Should there be term limits for all elected state officials, governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, as well as assembly members and state senators? I don't believe that there should be term limits. I think that what we should do is have more people participate in elections to hold elected officials accountable. We have the most corrupt state in the United States of America. The past three governors left in scandal, Schneiderman, Hevesy, Skelos, Silver, Bruno, the recent lieutenant governor arrested for bribery and corruption. We need to hold elected officials accountable. If they don't do what the people want, we need to kick them out of office. It's in the city. City's still standing. I believe Term limits. my experience in Congress is, is I know a lot more now than I did when I joined Congress five and a half years ago. I know a lot more now after eight years as mayor and eight years as county executive. I'm a much more effective, proven executive because of the experience that I have. Ms. Hochul, term limits statewide? Yes, I already proposed term limits for statewide officials, but I intentionally left out the Assembly and the Senate because I support the model that we have in Washington. The executive leadership, of which I'm part of today, should have eight years terms, but then the legislative branch, like Congress, should not have restrictions. So that is the, what I proposed uh, to the voters this past year. Okay. Mr. Williams? The experience that was just spoken about uh, has led us here. And so just saying we're going to keep the model gives us what we already have. And so I do support uh, term limits for everyone. But I also agree, the executive has a different job than the legislature. So the legislature should definitely be a longer term uh, than the executive. But what we have here, and New Yorkers understand, they're not feeling good about housing. They're not feeling good about public safety. What we have in Albany has not worked for them. That's why I keep saying we can't return to that old normal. We need a new normal. And that's what my governorship will represent. Thank you. Governor Colfagal, the next question is for you. Some types of cryptocurrency mining are harmful to the environment. The state legislature has passed a bill um, pausing the energy intensive process that Bitcoin and some other currencies rely on. Today, you signaled that you might not sign the legislative bill, the legislature's bill for another six months, which falls after the general election. You've signed other bills, such as the gun control package within days. The New York Times and Politico have reported that both you and your lieutenant governor candidate, Antonio Delgado, are receiving substantial support from crypto donors. What can you tell our viewers to assure them that your decision to delay the signing isn't influenced by their support? I have been a public servant for over 30 years. People have supported me. There is no connection between any support I received and decisions because I'll always do what's in the best interest of New Yorkers and that has not changed. All I was doing was answering a question today to explain that we have over 800 bills that were passed and this bill came up at the very end of session. We didn't have a chance to have our legislative team engage with it to work out any problems or or to say yes or no or any, any, any modifications that normally occurs in the process. So all I was saying is that the outer limit 
is six months because I have to do this by the end of the year. So that was not a statement that characterized yes or no. It was simply saying it passed a few days ago. I have 800 some bills to review, and this is absolutely going to get my full attention. But on that on that very question, we have to be very cautious about allowing more facilities to come and go into formally closed fossil fuel generating plants. We have a different situation where some may be generating hydroelectric power, for example. I need to be able to examine the differences, but I'm not interested in doing anything to harm the environment because I have the, mo the nation leading most ambitious environmental protection plan, climate resistance plan in America, including a $4.2 billion bond act that I need the voters, I need all of you at home uh, to get out and make sure you vote for this November Governor, because our children's go. and grandchildren's lives depend upon it. Mr. Swazi. I just want to point out that uh, when Governor Hochul was a member of Congress, she had a 50% <clears throat> rating from the League of Conservation Voters in her first year, 68% for her overall term. The lowest any Democrat in Congress has to What does it have to do with cryptocurrency? It has, she's talked about who she takes money from. She took money from the NRA. Uh, when she was asked, why did you take money from the NRA? Why did you vote with the NRA? Why did you get endorsed by the NRA? She said, I did it because I needed it for the votes in my district. Now, where's, where's the principle in that? I don't understand that. As far as cryptocurrency goes and, and the effect on the environment, I want to point out that I was the New York League of Conservation Voters for all of New York State. So, but do you support the cryptocurrency bill? I support the idea of a moratorium, but I think it should have been shorter than two years. Mr. Williams. You know, I just want to be clear so New Yorkers understand. There is a through line between donations that were given during the Cuomo Hochul administration to now and what they're feeling. People in real estate who gave money, so now people are feeling the effects of eviction. 220,000 people are facing eviction of foreclosure. Climate change was an abysmal failure in this legislature. There is no money for the Climate Protection Act that, passed, that, that, that was passed several years ago. We have been leading the charge to say we have to have a moratorium. As you mentioned, why would you not say, yes, I will do this in the next few days, even if you don't have time to do it now? And you cannot ignore the connection between money going to a candidate and them not doing what's right for something that's being banned in other countries. And by the way, there are other ways to mine for crypto. So this is not a moratorium on crypto. It's a, a moratorium on the worst way to mine places that the are being banned. Mr. Williams, Governor, in, did, okay. you, did you want to respond? Oh, I'm happy to respond. Um, there's a lot here. And I will simply say, I have been a public official for 30 years. I have always acted and voted in the best interest of the people in my district and my, my, at this point now, as governor of the state of New York, I will do whatever is in the best interest of the people of this state. And that is a hallmark of how I've conducted my entire public life. And as I said about the NRA, that is an attack from over a decade ago. And I said, I represented a district back then that was very different. And I have evolved on that issue. And heaven help us if we don't get more people to evolve their positions and see the light of day after all these mass shootings as well as the day-to-day -day shooting and that is why I have made public safety job number one to protect the health of the people but also the safety of New Yorkers and what we did yesterday signing 10 bills into law that people said could not get finished are going to be an important first start toward restoring people's faith that we will have the courage, the guts to lead, and that's exactly what New York did. Time we led the nation. Thank you, Ms. Hochul. This is from Mr. Williams. Should the state pay compensation to the grieving families of the more than 15,000 patients, I believe the number is, of nursing homes and long-term care facilities who died of COVID, their families say, due to state policies under the Cuomo administration? The short answer, of course, they should. When I ran for lieutenant governor uh, against the governor now, we said we needed a lieutenant governor who will stand up and speak out when New Yorkers were suffering. We didn't get that. During the pandemic, many people were telling me, don't speak out against the governor. He's doing great press conferences. And I said, in between those press conferences, people are dying, just like the people you just mentioned. We turned out to be correct. I wish we had someone that would stand up then, when it was hard, not when it was easy, when he was on his way out. But what we have in the Republican Party right now <clears throat> is because of incumbency protection, people are getting massacred in the street. Unfortunately, Democratic leaders, and this is not specific to any one person, but Democratic leaders have continued to make decisions based on what's best for them to get reelected, 
and not the New Yorker. And the New Yorker understands what they're feeling right now as they're facing eviction, as they're facing foreclosure. They cannot pay for food. They're feeling unsafe. That is the cost of the way Albany has operated. A new governor will have a new Albany. Mr. Swazi, should the state pay compensation to the victims who died in nursing homes? You know, everybody's been through a trauma with COVID. Uh, I actually lost my father-in-law early on during COVID in April of 2020. Uh, he was in an assisted living facility and went to a hospital and died shortly thereafter. Uh, so many families are suffering. I don't know why we haven't had hearings to get to the bottom of exactly what happened here, to find out what the facts actually are. I don't know why the governor has not put together a committee to look at this so we could learn lessons from what we went through. Now, I know how desperate a time New Yorkers faced back in 2020, more than any other place in the country. I remember the picture on your news programs and others of seeing people lined up in the freezing cold with the rain coming down, people coughing on each other, trying to go get a test. And there were refrigerator trucks full of bodies. Uh, we have not learned the lessons from COVID because we didn't have a comprehensive plan to address Omicron back in uh, November, December, January of last year, uh, while the governor was traveling the state doing fundraising. Ms. Hochul, does the state owe those grieving families compensation? My first weeks on the job as governor, I brought in the families who are representing the voices of countless others who are absolutely devastated by what happened to their loved one in a nursing home because they were not protected. Weeks ago, I said, I want a complete analysis of what happened during COVID, the good, the bad, the ugly, and that includes nursing homes. So give us time to put together a blue ribbon commission of people who are independent, not the consultants who are advising the last administration. I want to make sure we find out exactly what happened in the nursing home. Do those people well, deserve compensation? I gave them an apology and I said I will look at this even further to determine what else we can do to help them. Okay. We're going to move on here to this final segment and we're looking for one word answers. Mm. Hope you can pull that off. Please Me give too. us one word answers. Uh, and we'll start with this. In one word, and we'll start with Mr. Williams. What is the one thing you simply cannot live without besides your family? One word. My love of theater and acting. <laughs> Ms. Hochul. My Bible. Mr. Swazi. I probably have to say my phone. Um, the next question goes to you, Governor. Um, what's your absolute Number one biggest pet peeve. One word. You can't be a couple words. Okay, go for a couple. I'll, I'll give you on this. You can have three words. Uh, people talking on cell phones, on airplanes when the, they should be turned off, or other places uh, disrupting this, the peace and quiet of other travelers. Okay. Mr. Swazi? Hypocrisy. Mr. Williams? people in these jobs for the wrong reason. Where'd we go? Who's, still, who's next? Mr. Swazi. Mr. Swazi, sorry. Mr. Swazi, do you believe in ghosts? No. <laughs> Mr. Williams. I believe in spirits, though. Yeah, I guess I do. Okay. Mr. Spirits? Williams. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mr. Williams. I'm a man of faith, so I don't know if I call it ghosts, uh, but I do believe in afterlife, and my ancestors are there. Ms. Hochul. Yeah, I, I speak to my mother all the time. I lost her just months before I became lieutenant governor, and she led a challenging life, and I draw inspiration from her every single day. So, yes, I do communicate with someone who's no longer with so us. So, Mr. Williams, in one word, Superman or Batman? Oh, man, I got to go Batman there. <laughs> governor? Superwoman. <laughs> Mr. Swasey? Superman. Ms. Hochul, what's your biggest weakness or flaw? There's probably many. Um, ask my husband of 38 years. Uh, I am a real stickler for just details. I'm always pressing people to give me more information and more information, more. My feel for my staff, because I'm always pressing them to give me more answers. Mr. Swazi. When I see a problem, I have to solve it. I always have to try and come up with the answer. One end. word. <laughs> she just had like 20 words. Okay, fine. <laughs> Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams. Yeah, I said I have Tourette syndrome, ADHD. I have related OCD symptoms. Uh, so that can be good, sometimes a focus. Uh, and I love my wife. I'm sure she may have some different stories. So, Mr. Swazi, okay. Name one place from your childhood, one place 
from your childhood that you still wish still existed? There was a woods across from my house growing up where we used to make forts and things like that, and uh, they built a new development there. Mr. Williams. Uh, used to love going to Grenada to visit my grandmother. That house meant a land to me. It's no longer there. Governor. Crystal Beach, an amusement park uh, across the border from Buffalo that had an amazing roller coaster. Mr. Williams, what's your go-to karaoke song? My go-to karaoke song, it'll probably Maxwell Pretty Wings. Can you sing it? <laughs> pretty wings, oh, pretty wow. wings. That sounds just like it. <laughs> Ms. Williams, uh, Ms. Hochul, sorry. Yeah, so to my wife. Go-to wife. karaoke yes. has to be Sweet Caroline, and I'm not singing it. Oh, come on, Governor. Nope. Mr. Mr. Swazi. Our daughter is Caroline, so we sing that all the time, uh, but probably Beyond the Sea by Bobby Darren. And will you sing it? No. <laughs> Cowards. <laughs> we want to thank you all for a spirited debate. Thank Truly, you. thank you very much. Our coverage of tonight's debate doesn't end here, however. Do tune into our streaming service, CBS News New York, right now, where CBS 2's Dick Brennan will analyze the debate with a panel of experts. And next Monday at 7, we will have the leading Republican candidates for governor right here on CBS 2 and News Radio 880. And this reminder. Early voting for the primary runs from June 18th to the 26th. Election day is June 28th. Primary election day, the 28th. Polls open at 6 a.m. And do check out our voter guide on cbsnewyork.com. We thank you so much for joining us tonight. For Marsha Kramer and everybody here at CBS2, I'm Maurice Dubois. We'll see you on the news tonight at 11 o'clock. Have a good evening.